So, good morning, everybody. It's nice if you can take a seat, everyone. So this um, morning, we are very uh, happy to welcome Philip Baxbom here to ICPIC. Phil started his uh, academic career um, as uh, an undergrad at Harvard College, and then he moved on to graduate school at University of California at Berkeley. And there he got his PhD in 1980. At this time, he was working with uh, peritoneal conservation in thallium. Um, when he, um, uh, after a short postdoc in Berkeley, he joined Bell Laboratories, where he stayed for quite some time, until 19, 1989, when he was appointed applied, uh, associate professor in applied physics at Columbia University. After that, he continued to Ann Arbor for a professorship in physics, uh, and then in 2005 to Stanford for a joint appointment in physics, applied physics, and photon science. He now uh, holds a distinguished professorship in natural sciences and is the director of the so-called Pulse Institute for Ultrafast Energy. He is, he is a member of the American Academy of Art and Science and has uh, got a lot of awards and honors, which I will not tell you about. Um, in photon science, and especially when it comes to strong fields, uh, Phil Baxbaum has made the very early and important contributions to the field, and this concerns especially uh, our understanding of the bow threshold ionization, and also about uh, the bond softenings which takes place in molecules in very intense fields. Today his focus is on attosecond physics, on quantum control, and strong field laser matter interaction. And um, the most uh, recent addition to his toolbox is the X-ray free electron laser. So uh, we are today very happy to uh, have him here to talk about strong fields and X-ray free electron lasers for atomic and molecular physics. So welcome, Phil. Thanks. Thank, thanks very much. You know, it's, it's really, I'd like to thank the organizers for not only for inviting me, but for having this conference in such a beautiful place. Like many of you, I got to spend the weekend here sightseeing, and it's really magnificent. And uh, it's also a pleasure to uh, be uh, giving this address uh, in the International Year of Light and Light-Based Technologies, which is uh, 2015 has that designation. And of course, uh, uh, X-rays are another form of light that are extremely important. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, strong fields and X-ray free electron lasers, which produce strong fields and their effects on atoms. And before I get started, I want to introduce you to uh, some of my, my uh, close collaborators who have uh, participated in this work, uh, particularly Marcus Gurr, whose picture is right here, who's, uh, who, whose uh, work has been really influential, and uh, also uh, Todd Martinez, who provides us with a lot of theoretical insights and also a, a number of other uh, colleagues that you see here. Also my, my own group of uh, graduate students without whom, of course, uh, I wouldn't be here just as uh, m many of you uh, are in, the, I'm sure, a similar situation. These are the people who uh, really uh, keep everything happening. Um, because I work now in this field of free electron lasers, it, I no longer have uh, all the time just a small tabletop and a couple of graduate students. Uh, and, and so increasingly, this work depends on uh, coordination and collaboration. And you'll see uh, a number of lists of people in this talk. That's because I, I of course, uh, really feel it's important to give credit, uh, although already the list is too long to read everyone. Many of your names are actually on this list. And, and uh, so I want to thank you all, and also the uh, people who are not here who've helped with this work. So this is all about motion. I'm particularly interested in motion on the quantum scale. And so the first thing that I want to do to introduce this subject is bring you through my view of the hierarchy of motion in molecules, starting from the slowest. So I'm particularly interested in all of these areas, but let's start with uh, just free rotations in space. Of course, the reason that molecular physics is so, is so special is that the systems are compact and therefore quantized in all the degrees of freedom, uh, particularly rotations 
uh, which you see here, the characteristic time scale for rotations in small molecules is longer than picoseconds. The smallest molecule, H2, is about a picosecond, and other molecules can be longer. And so I just show here a rotating molecule. And now let's move forward to shorter and shorter time scales and see what kinds of motion there are. Uh, of course, molecules can also vibrate. The one, this is the characteristic they have that makes them different from atoms, of course. Um, this bending and stretching has a characteristic time scale that's faster than rotations, uh, typically on the order of, of uh, tens to hundreds of femtoseconds. And even if the molecule were not vibrating, it still has motion because it's got electrons in it that uh, have to, in order to be confined, have to have motion associated with them. Now, the characteristic time scale for that motion is given by just the binding energy of the electrons and, uh, and, and the, the size of the molecules. So angstroms and Rydbergs, you put those uh, constants together and you can see that that motion is on the order of a femtosecond or so. So this already gets us into a regime of uh, very, very short time scales that already is beginning to be challenging even for lasers because optical periods uh, tend to be on the order of a few femtoseconds. Uh, you can also look at the most tightly bound electrons in atoms, the, in, in molecules, that is the ones that are surrounding the nuclei in the atoms, and those have even more confinement, therefore they have even more momentum, larger uh, binding energies, and therefore faster motion. And that's where we really get into uh, attosecond motion, and this whole subject of attoscience typically involves these inner electrons. And then finally, what's the, what's the speed limit? Of course, it's the speed of light. And we know how big molecules are. Bonds are on the order of angstroms. The speed of light is three angstroms per attosecond. So there you really see that this attosecond scale from one to 1,000 or 10,000 attoseconds is going to encompass all of the physics of electron communication uh, be, uh, that cause bonding to happen in atoms. OK, now one can also take a sort of a quantum mechanical view uh, and try, use that as a way to um, try to figure out how we can interact with atoms in order to, and molecules in order to see this kind of motion. So I'm going to start with Schrodinger's equation. Uh, first point out to people, of course it's obvious to us atomic and molecular physicists, that Schrodinger's equation is a first order differential equation in time. And that means that the solutions are never static. Always, uh, you know, at, 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 they, they may be stationary, but generally speaking, there's something evolving in time. Uh, and if I divide the, this Hamiltonian that describes all of the interactions into the native interactions of the molecule and extra interactions that I pose from, out, impose from outside, you can see how uh, the, uh, the physics can be tested. Um, I can impose uh, an extra Hamiltonian on my system and change the way it evolves. Uh, now, I'm going to use this to check the fastest motion. That means that I'm going to use that external Hamiltonian as a, a kind of a shutter to make movies or a starter pistol to initiate action. And uh, particularly, I um, want to, to introduce the sort of simplifying idea of the impulse limit. That is, how fast the shutter speed needs to be in order to be useful to freeze motion is that it has to be fast compared to whatever the natural motion is. If we put that in quantum mechanical language, that means that we want that time scale to be less than uh, the inverse of the spacing of the energy eigenstates, their eigenvalue spacing in the system. Uh, also, in terms of strength, I want these two to both affect this uh, this uh, solution, the wave function of the molecule, and that means that they have to be comparable in, in strength. Okay, now I, I'll start with a very simple example, a very old one in, in, in my own research going back uh, more than 15 years. Uh, motion can be initiated by a simple excitation as long as the excitation time is less than that characteristic time scale that I need for the shutter speed, that is, the inverse of the energy splitting. So I show it here in a cesium atom. Here's some, some of the relevant cesium energy levels. 
And uh, what I need to do is have a short pulse compared to the dynamics of the levels that I want to interrogate. Uh, so, uh, for example, if those are the Rydberg levels, then with 150 femtosecond pulse, which is a very convenient pulse to produce in a laboratory, uh, that has a bandwidth uh, on the order of uh, uh, 10 or so nanometers, I can conveniently excite all of these together. And then I can excite, I can cause the molecule to undergo dynamics that I've initiated uh, with my external field. Now, these are all P states. That means that the shape of these wave functions is P-like. Here I, I draw uh, a P-type wave function. And if I take a radial cut through that wave function, it looks like that. And uh, because these eigenvalues are not the same, uh, they evolve at different rates. And that means that they superpose to make the wave function actually move. So this is a way to create waves in a molecule. So very, very simple idea. Just by making the pulse short, I can initiate motion. Now, in order to, to, to do that example, I needed to have a tunable radiation source that could directly excite from where I start in an atom to a series of states. But it turns out that that actually isn't a requirement. And in fact, I can do an awful lot of physics without having uh, a, a source that happens to be tuned to a resonant frequency because of the possibility of having two photon interactions, scattering, so-called Raman scattering, where uh, a, an initial state is uh, excited and then de-excited with a broad bandwidth pulse. So this up and down is, of course, the exchange of two photons. You see it here in a Feynman diagram. This state here isn't actually the, 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 isn't the location of any of the eigenstates in the atom. It's a, it's a virtual level. It's off resonance. The only thing that has to be in resonance is the difference frequency. And because of the broad bandwidth of the short pulse, I can interrogate a lot of states. So this shows the sort of general framework, the Cromer's-Heisenberg formula that describes that. Of course, it requires two interactions with the field. And so there are two dipole interaction terms that are involved. And because one of them is absorbed and the other one is, admitted, is emitted, you get an, an awful lot of, of simplifications in the problem. But one of the most important one is the requirement for intensity. The total rate for this process is going to go like the rate for two photons being present simultaneously. In other words, it goes like the intensity squared. So I want to use that to work on the first real physics prob problem that I'm going to describe today. And that is the problem of interacting with the rotational degrees of freedom of a molecule in order to create uh, an aligned molecule. So here are the energy levels in, uh, a, uh, in any uh, freely rotating a uh, diatomic molecule has an energy spacing that increases linearly with the quantum number of rotation. Uh, and uh, here are the two photons involved in a Raman excitation that will take the molecule from an initial state to a collection of final states. Now, one way to view that problem uh, when it's done with a very, very short pulse is as a kind of an impulsive kick. So here's a kind of a classical view of a molecule. Uh, the presence of that laser field, as I showed before, in Schrodinger's equation, that's just another term in the Hamiltonian. The particular term that's involved in a Raman excitation is an angle-dependent Hamiltonian. Depends on the field squared and depends on the angle of the polarization of the field with respect to the line connecting the two atoms, the interatomic axis. And uh, that minus sign means that it's an attractive potential, so that there's actually an angle-dependent potential well that uh, is uh, present in this molecular system. And this very, very short impulse is like a kick that kicks the molecule into alignment. So I show here the expectation value of alignment, that is, the average value of the uh, angle of the, or the cosine of the angle uh, of the axis of an ensemble of molecules. And you can see that every once in a while, 
the molecules are aligned when all of these levels are phased correctly, and then at other times they dephase and then come back. Here, as a function of time, in units of the rotational constant of the molecule, you can see that following a kick you get alignment, and then some other funny stuff happens, and you get more alignment. Here you get a kind of a pancake distribution where the molecules are typically uh, as far from being aligned as possible. Uh, on the bottom of this slide, I show the results of an experiment that just did exactly this. Uh, this experiment used not just one kick, but eight kicks that had a very particular time sequence where the, the, the next kick in the sequence always happened just when the molecules were coming into alignment. So this is then a succession of kicks, kick, 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 at just the right time so that the uh, alignment can be enhanced on every kick. And you can see this is, this is data collected on the alignment angle of an ensemble. You can see how following a kick, here's a kick, there's much greater alignment following the next kick, much greater alignment, and that'll just keep going. So this is an example of a very simple kind of quantum, quantum control that allows us at various times, say this time here, to create a highly aligned ensemble of molecules. Now, once you have the ability to interact with molecules and change them in this way, of course, there are a lot of other physical opportunities that are open to you. In fact, uh, the, the multiple kick quantum revivals displays all of the rich physics of, of all periodic quantum systems. This one just happens to be periodic in time, kick, 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 but it's quite analogous to systems that are periodic in space, such as crystals. And so, for, for example, depending on, on uh, how you uh, space out the kicks, uh, if the, if the uh, quantum resonance is maintained and I always kick exactly on that resonance, uh, the molecule molecular alignment will increase. Eventually, though, it stops increasing and it actually starts decreasing and goes through these oscillations. This is just block oscillations, uh, in, which uh, have, have also, of course, uh, a, a high importance in condensed matter physics. Uh, if I change the spacing and uh, instead of having uh, the kick exactly at the right time, change the, uh, away from the resonant condition. Of course, the block oscillations go away, and uh, I recover this, this black curve where there's much, much less alignment. Uh, and, and then, if I start to introduce disorder, I can get disorder-induced localization of the angle where the alignment comes back. So all of these kinds of games are possible uh, in uh, playing with the external degrees of freedom of, of uh, molecules. OK, so with that introduction, I now want to start to speed up the time scale that I'm interested in and start to look at some of the fastest time scales of electrons moving around in molecules. So to motivate this, I'm going to show you a calculation. It's not my calculation. It's one by the uh, group of uh, Sederbaum, where he uh, does the thought experiment. What would happen if I suddenly eliminated one of the electrons from a molecule. He can do that, of course, in a calculation infinitely fast. Uh, and uh, here are uh, a few uh, systems that he studied. A krypton removing uh, one of the inner electrons, the 2p electron. Uh, CO2 removing a pi electron. And, um, and methyl acetamide here uh, removing uh, another inner uh, electron. And in all cases, once the electron is removed, you have an ion but all of the electrons are kind of in the wrong place for the ion. So they start evolving, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, any measure of the, uh, of the evolution, so for example, the whole occupation uh, for the hole that was initially created goes through very rapid oscillations. And if you look at the time scale here, now you immediately begin to see the attosecond time scale come into play. So the suggestion is that if I can ionize the system fast enough, I begin to see very, very fast dynamics. Well, as an experimentalist, we have to figure out how we can approximate this. So uh, one idea is to take as short or strong a pulse as you have and blast away, blast away at, a, at an atom. So uh, here's a short pulse. This is, of course, 
the way I think of a short pulse uh, in, in the lab is an oscillating electric field. There you see the oscillations. Uh, and uh, here's a little confined electron. This is a hydrogen atom. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, allow this atom to evolve not according to its just native Schrodinger equation, but the Schrodinger equation when I add that laser field. And what happens, here's the laser field oscillating back and forth. And you can see the electron probability is starting to leak out of the atom. This is just field ionization. This is distortion of the Coulomb potential by such an extreme amount that uh, electrons uh, fall out. Or uh, because it's quantum mechanics, it's also possible for them to tunnel out of this barrier when the barrier gets to be small enough. Classically, you can think of the electron just getting pulled away. Uh, this uh, calculation is uh, repeating over and over again, so you can see the initial stages of, of, of ionization. Um, the, the net effect of all of that, uh, after uh, the pulse goes through, is to produce an interesting spectrum of electrons. This is something that's been, been, been known about for about, uh, I don't know, on the order of 25 years or so. Uh, the, uh, the electron spectrum consists of these sharp peaks. This is called above threshold ionization. And the, the peaks line up in an interesting way, so that if you, if you try to count how many photons of this field add up to make the energy of each one of these electrons, it, it tends to add up OK. There are a lot of caveats to that that I won't go into here. But the point is, it's, it's, it's possible to do this experiment in a gentle enough way so you can see this nice above threshold ionization spectrum. Okay? Uh, what I'd like to know about this is where's the out of second dynamics and uh, how can I recover it? So um, we became uh, interested in ways that we could interrogate this spectrum. Um, and uh, we wanted to answer a very simple question. When, it might, it's simple, but it might even be ill-posed, when during a laser cycle do the different parts of the electron spectrum emerge. That is, you sometimes have a, a electrons coming out with high energy, sometimes low energy. You saw that whole energy distribution. What's the relative timing of the different parts of the distribution? Um, you can actually measure that uh, using the above threshold ionization spectrum as a kind of a reference clock. Because you know that the reason that these peaks are discrete is because you have a process that's happening over and over again on every cycle over, uh, the same way. Electrons emitted from field ionization, electrons emitted again from field ionization, and they all add up constructively at peaks that are separated by uh, h-bar divided by that energy splitting, in other words, by that amount of time. So uh, to figure out what the relative time delay or phase delay is of these different peaks, um, we uh, did an interference experiment, a which path interference experiment, where we created a new series of peaks halfway in between each of these by adding a second field at half the frequency, and then looked at whether the, the combination of adding one photon to this ATI peak or subtracting one photon to this one was constructive or destructive when it interfered to make this extra peak. Now, it's kind of a dramatic effect as you change the relative phase between the half-frequency field and the, and, and the field that's producing the electrons. Um, here is a, a, a velocity map imaging device where uh, the uh, electron velocities are all mapped radially away from the central point. And so different above-threshold ionization peaks appear as different, uh, different uh, circular lines in this, in this spectrum. And what I'm showing is just data collected in our lab over the last uh, a couple of years ago uh, as we change, slowly change the phase of the half-frequency field with respect to the strong field that's producing the electrons. We see these half-integer peaks come and go. And they come and go at different times, at different phases, showing that the different peaks uh, actually uh, have, uh, have different phase delays associated with them. Well, you can convert that rather easily directly back into uh, an answer to the question about time. Uh, and here that is plotted. Um, as, uh, as the uh, different ATI peaks uh, interfere in our system, we see that they have different phase delays 
that vary by on the order of 100 femtosecond, 100 attoseconds from each other. Uh, here is one cycle of our strong field that was producing the electrons. And just for scale, here's a one femtosecond bar. So the fact that all of the electrons are different in phase by only about a, a tenth of a femtosecond is a suggestion that they're, producing, that they're produced over a rather small fraction of that cycle. Now, this phenomenon of strong field ionization is actually useful for producing light as well. In fact, high harmonic generation is just a manifestation of this. And this is a consequence of this at a second response when you try to place an atom in a field that's so strong that you can begin to affect the electron motion as much as the atom's own internal dynamics affect the motion. So again, this picture of uh, Coulomb potential uh, and uh, the classical version of an electron being pulled away from the atom. But now I continue the cycle and show that under some circumstances, the electron can be driven back into the atom. And when it does that, it has some additional energy that can be given up into the radiation field. Uh, a spectrometer placed downstream from a gas of atoms that's illuminated by this way, it's a simple experiment, focus into a, a, uh, a gas of atoms, collect the light, filter out the visible light that was used to drive the atoms, and look in the vacuum ultraviolet spectrum, and you see a beautiful spectrum. The, the physics uh, of, uh, or to say the, the, uh, the, the parameter space of these high harmonics is really well described by the classical physics of pulling an electron away and slamming it back into the atom. And this is a way of producing radiation that's out here in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the wave, wavelength range of uh, just a few hundred angstroms, 15 to 50 nanometers. Uh, the uh, intensity has been, this has been studied a lot because once you can make a source of radiation that you can use for a lot of different things, people become very interested in it. Uh, the, the spectrum depends on how strong the atom is bound, depends on how intense the light is that you uh, shine on the atoms, and also depends on the frequency of the light, in fact, uh, goes with the, with the square of the wavelength. So we can use that high harmonic generation as its own way of measuring strong field response of atoms. There are a lot of different ways of doing that. Let me just show you one. This high harmonic in molecules is sensitive to the alignment of the molecules. So we've talked about how to align molecules. Now here's an experiment where you align the molecule. This is a, a familiar plot. I showed it before of the molecular alignment as a function of time following a kick, they kick the molecules in alignment, and then they go through a revival at a later time. Uh, if I look at high harmonic generation at all different time delays here, I see that the high harmonic generation, this is the time axis, I see that the harmonic generation is also going through lots of maxima and minima. In fact, in some ways, it looks a lot like this picture. When the molecules are aligned, you get a lot of harmonic generation. When the molecules are anti-aligned, you get relatively less. Uh, that then gives us a way of measuring some of the strong field response of molecules that depend on the orientation of the molecule. So here's a kind of a, of a picture of how the strong field ionization might be modified depending on the direction that the field is pulling electrons away from a molecule. Here's a simple kind of a schematic of a, of a, two, uh, of a diatomic molecule. Here are the two atoms. And uh, the electrons that bind the atoms are kind of living in the space between them. They have different forms. The, the highest occupied orbital, in this case, it's, uh, we're, we're in, in, in this case might, might look like this. This is the sigma uh, state in uh, nitrogen. Um, a, uh, a, a, more, uh, a, a more deeply bound electron might look like this pi orbital. The point is that the electron that tunnels over this barrier and gets pulled out, I can think of it as this little piece of electron probability amplitude streaming through this minimum point in the Coulomb barrier, uh, doesn't look like either of these orbitals. It's got to look like some, some combination of them, some superposition. 
And that immediately suggests that when I field ionize a molecule, I'm, I'm not very likely to just be pulling an electron away from one of the orbitals. It's much more likely that I leave the molecule in some state where I might have pulled more than, uh, more, uh, uh, an electron from more than one orbital, some kind of a superposition state. And the superposition state will have a natural time evolution which has at a second dynamics simply because the splitting between these uh, two orbitals can be large, can be on the order of several EV. So, so here is a real life version of that, uh, of that idea. This is high harmonic generation in diatomic nitrogen, ordinary nitrogen molecule. Uh, here's a little schematic of what's going on. This is the highest occupied molecular orbital in, in, uh, in, in nitrogen. It's this nice looking sigma state. It's well aligned with the molecular axis. And this, this picture of a carpet coming back, this is the, my idea of an electron wave coming back and recombining with this orbital having, after having been field ionized away. Okay. Uh, because I can align the molecular ensemble, I can actually change the direction of the electric field. I can pull electrons off this way or this way or this way. Here are the different angles. And the high harmonic spectrum changes dramatically. Here, these are the different harmonics that are produced by high harmonic generation, just like that spectrometer picture, but now I'm showing you line outs. And depending on whether the molecules were aligned at, with the field or perpendicular to the field or in between, you get big, big differences between these, these, uh, these spectra. Well, what's evidently going on here is related to that picture of which orbital was field ionized. You can see that if you focus on a couple of different harmonics, the 21st harmonic and the 45th harmonic. The 21st harmonic is in the middle of the pack. Uh, it's a harmonic which it has a strong contribution from this highest occupied orbital. And you can see, in fact, that it's a maximum when that orbital is aligned with the field. And it goes down to being nearly a minimum, or very much smaller, when the orbital is perpendicular to the field. On the other hand, if you look out here at, 45, at the 45th harmonic, you see a, a rather peaking up of the spectrum at 90 degrees. And that's because the principal contribution way out here is this orbital, this HOMO minus 1, which is a pi orbital which is more aligned with, uh, with, with, with the field when the molecule is perpendicular to the field. Here are the two nitrogen atoms here. Okay. Uh, in between is in between. You get a superposition of those orbitals with all kinds of interesting out of second dynamics going on. Okay. Well, not only can you see out of second dynamics just in looking at the harmonic spectrum, but the harmonics themselves are a source of out of second pulses. And the reason is because that, that picture of field ionization and recombination means that on every half cycle, there is a recollision of electrons that were field ionized near the peak, just as I showed from that earlier experiment where we actually measured the, the dispersion in the uh, field ionization, uh, and then recombine uh, at some other time in the cycle, where you get a nice at a second burst here or here or here. Every half cycle, you get an at a second burst. You can actually play around a little bit with the, with the, uh, the laser field, add a little second harmonic to it so that the field looks like this and you only get one burst per cycle. That's a common trick. <clears throat> the, 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 the physics of that field ionization is such that depending on when the recombination happens, the recombining kinetic energy will be different. And so that means that across this high harmonic spectrum, um, there is a, a, a chirp, a, a time spread between uh, when the uh, highest harmonics in the comb are produced and when the lowest harmonics. Uh, if you look at each high harmonic burst, you can see that, that time chirp. This is just the Fourier transform of a chirped at a second pulse occurring every half cycle. OK, so the idea now is to use these at a second pulses to begin to do some at a second physics. And one of, the, one of the promises for this, not yet accomplished, but we've been 
we've been uh, you know, working on getting this to happen, is to move away from this uh, simple idea of using uh, short pulse lasers to photo excite or photo ionize the system to go back to this Raman idea, just like with the, uh, just like with the, with, with the alignment of molecules. Uh, that's a, a rotational Raman. I could also do electronic Raman, where I excite and then de-excite an atom, uh, producing then a superposition of all of the different valence states in the atom, basically a localized electronic wave that can then move around a molecule and explore, uh, just like dropping a pebble into, the, into a pond uh, causes ripples that move out in the pond, and the ripples allow you to explore the nature of the pond, its edges and what obstructions there are. So it's the same in a molecule. If I can do an experiment like this where I have a Raman process that creates a very localized excitation, that excitation can then move out and explore the molecule. Well, you know, that's a, a Raman process, which means that it's quadratic in the intensity. Uh, ordinary field ionization, which is a much more likely process at low intensities, is linear. So at some point, the quadratic overtakes linear, and actually the Raman process becomes more likely than the linear process uh, for high enough intensities. And this is a simple experiment, a simple calculation in sodium which is the most favorable case we could think of. And uh, that crossover happens at around 10 to the 15 watts per square centimeter. That sounds like it's a very high intensity. It's about, um, <clears throat> it's about 10 volts per angstrom for field strength. But it is an intensity that these high harmonics can, can reach if you do everything right. And uh, in that case, we should be able to produce a lot of Raman excited uh, molecules. Now, a way to think about this Raman process is that we've made pulses that are so short that we're, the spectrum of those pulses can both excite into an auto-ionizing resonance in the molecule of the atom or the molecule, and also de-excite from that auto-ionized resonance back down to the valence states. All of that's encompassed in the same bandwidth, and you get into that regime when the uh, full width half max of your laser pulse is short enough so that the bandwidth gets broad enough. And typically for a whole range of atoms and molecules, you need to get into the one femtosecond range. So one, so out of second pulses are ideal for this Raman stuff. Uh, what's shown here on a log scale is the relative probability for ionization, those are the dotted lines, or Raman excitation. And you can see that if the pulse is too long, three femtoseconds or five femtoseconds, You'll never, you hardly ever see the Raman excitation. Ionization dominates by many orders of magnitude. But once you get down to one femtosecond, this bandwidth spreads out, and Raman begins to take over. So this is the, the direction this field is going. I just wanted to share that with you. OK, there's another tool that we've started to uh, work on uh, rather recently in the last five years, and that's the X-ray free electron laser. I'm at Stanford, and there happens to be one at Stanford, but they are also uh, existing in more and more parts of the world. Europe is in the process of building its second, third, and fourth X-ray free electron laser, so uh, there will be quite a few of them in the coming decades. Um, the, the whole process involves a linear accelerator, so here's the one that happened to exist at SLAC in advance, and so we were able to use it and a very, very long undulator. An undulator is a periodic array of magnetic fields, north, south, north, south, and so on, a few centimeters separated from each other. So a real macroscopic thing. Very, very long, though. This array goes on typically for many tens of meters, maybe, maybe more than 100 meters. Okay. Uh, what happens in this periodic array is that uh, the electrons wiggle, of course, back and forth in the magnetic field. And uh, they produce synchrotron radiation as they go uh, through the magnetic bends. And the synchrotron radiation uh, adds up on every one of these poles. Now, that addition turns this into what would be called a wiggler. But the very special thing about a free electron laser is that the radiation produced on successive bends adds coherently. Now, in order to add coherently, it has to be such that the uh, the radiation produced on one bend and the radiation produced on another bend are phase coherent. 
And since the electrons are going almost the speed of light, but they're not going in a straight line, it's simply the difference in distance between the electron, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the photon path, which is, of course, moving in a straight line, and the electron path, which is deviating because it's bending in the magnet. That difference in distance can be on the order of an angstrom. Then you produce angstrom radiation on resonance, and it builds up cycle after cycle. Here's the formula that describes what I just talked about. Typically, for the GeV-style electron accelerators that can be conventionally built these days, this produces radiation that's on the order of angstrom-style radiation, angstrom to, to, to uh, tens of angstroms. The power can be a good fraction, maybe uh, part in 10 to the 4 or part in 10 to the 3 of the energy that was in the electron beam, which means that these are millijoule-type uh, 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 lasers, which uh, puts them in the same category as other high-field lasers that we can produce in the optical. Um, here's a, a simulation of a bunch of electrons uh, in a co-moving frame moving through the undulator array. And you can see that they actually bunch up. This bunching is extremely important because without it, each one of the electrons would be producing coherent radiation, but the coherent radiation from different electrons would be out of phase. The bunching is actually uh, uh, caused by the back action of the radiation produced by the electrons themselves back on the electrons that speeds some up and slows others down and produces a natural bunching. So that's really what turns us into a laser. Um, the radiation power as a function of time tends to have these femtosecond or even sub-femtosecond bursts of radiation separated by a few femtoseconds over the length of an electron pulse. So these are now sources of femtosecond radiation, maybe even sources of attosecond radiation, if we can find a way to use them. Uh, one of the interesting possibilities that's being pursued a lot lately is to uh, turn that, that set of spikes into just a single burst, a single spike of radiation. Uh, here's uh, one way of doing it, a slotted spoiler. Um, I, I want to talk more about the atomic physics, so I won't talk in detail about how this works, but to suffice it to say that uh, in order to get those electrons to phase up with each other, they have to be rather, rather bright, extremely cold, and anything I do to mess up their emittance um, will spoil it. That's why this is called a spoiler. So by putting a small slot in uh, a region of the electron uh, beam where the beam is dispersed, I can create a little region that lases. All the rest of it doesn't lase, and I end up with a single spike. OK, so, so what are the opportunities for atomic and molecular physics here? Well, if we look at um, what the X-ray radiation does in a molecule, uh, mostly it's core photoionization. Uh, that's because uh, this very, very high frequency radiation it has a much lower cross-section for exciting these valence electrons than for exciting the core electrons. So mostly what happens is core ionization. That leaves the atom in a very highly excited state from which it has to relax. It relaxes through a kind of a quantum evaporative cooling called Auger relaxation, where one of the electrons fills the empty vacancy in the lower shell and gives up its energy to another electron, which evaporates out of the system. That leaves you with a doubly ionized atom. So a very common thing to happen when you shine x-rays onto, say, nitrogen gas is to produce a lot of nitrogen dications. Uh, here uh, are uh, a lot of potential energy curves for the nitrogen dications, and you can see that all of these states that are near this gray shaded region, which is at the interatomic separation of neutral nitrogen, can be excited by the process of Auger relaxation. Uh, these then can all be studied using uh, this way to produce uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the dications. The interesting thing about doing this with a short pulse laser, like a free electron laser, is now we can do all of this with an aligned ensemble and catch the molecules when they're all aligned. And that way, we can make angular distributions of every one of those components of the OJ spectrum that correspond to each one of those states of the molecular dication. Uh, this is a rather easy thing to do because the pulse of radiation is much, much shorter 
than the uh, amount of time that the molecular ensemble stays aligned. Now, the ionization rate can be extremely rapid from these, uh, from these kinds of, of, uh, of focused beams. And here again is nitrogen gas. And uh, I show that photoionization schematically again. And uh, before Auger relaxation can happen, it's quite possible for photoionization to get rid of the other 1s electron in the nitrogen atom. And when that happens, you end up with a hollow atom. There's no more 1s electrons. There's no more opportunity for photoionization of that shell until OJ relaxation can fill the shell. Uh, and so that creates a situation where the, the, the process stops because it's waiting for OJ to happen. Now, the length of time for this OJ process to occur tends to be on the order of a few femtoseconds. So if the X-ray laser pulse is short compared to a few femtoseconds, then photoionization turning off creates a situation where I turn off the process of stripping down the atom. Uh, I, uh, after OJ occurs, I can continue to photoionize and eventually strip down the atom. So you can see that it's actually a rather dramatic effect if you compare the, uh, total, uh, 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 the total yield of highly ionized atoms um, uh, for different pulse durations of the free electron laser. This is one of the wonderful things we can do with free electron laser technology. We can create a laser that has the same pulse energy, in this case about a quarter of a millijoule, but has different pulse durations. Here we have 280 femtoseconds, all the way down to 5 to 10 femtoseconds. And uh, all I plot here, very, very simple, easy to collect data, it's just the uh, spectrum of the highly charged ionization states, stages of, of, of nitrogen. Here's, here's the uh, nitrogen uh, uh, molecular dication, uh, and then here are the higher charge states. And you can see by comparing, say, the, the, the red curve to the blue curve to the green curve, red to blue to green, that as the pulse duration gets shorter, even though the total pulse energy is the same, the higher ionization states just turn off because of this process of waiting for, for decay, the, the double, double core formation. Uh, that also gives you an opportunity to look at the relaxation from a double core excited uh, atom for the first time. So here's a, a spectrum of uh, the Auger spectrum. This is this evaporative relaxation spectrum uh, from nitrogen. But up here at higher energy is a little extra part of the spectrum. Here I've shown it blown up by a factor of 10. And here uh, on a separate graph, so you can see it more easily. <clears throat> this is the spectrum of relaxation from hollow atoms, those with, uh, with uh, both of the 1s electrons missing. The, the blue curve is a kind of a crude calculation of what you might expect to see. You see there's one already is beginning to do Auger spectroscopy on these exotic states. OK. Now, <clears throat> with the few minutes I have remaining, I want to show uh, a couple of uh, X-ray probe experiments where we're beginning to use this X-ray laser to probe transient effects in the electrons in molecules. The first one is um, looking at photoionization uh, and Auger-induced motion in a molecule. Uh, and the second one is an X-ray probe of UV-induced motion. So first, let's look at the probe of X-ray-induced motion. So how do X-rays induce motion in a molecule? Well, here's a very simple molecule, acetylene. It's the simplest, it's the smallest organic molecule that's capable of rearranging its atoms, isomerizing. And uh, when an X-ray hits it, uh, of course, it goes through this process of carbon core excitation, core ionization, and then OJ relaxation, so you end up with a dication. And then various things can happen. Uh, it can either dissociate into two CHs, or it can deprotonate with one of the protons spitting off, or what, one of the more interesting things to happen is it can rearrange where the protons move around and form this other form of the molecule called vanillidine, where CH2 comes off and a carbon goes off in the other direction. <clears throat> it's a simple molecule, and so there have been a lot of calculations. 
uh, I show some of the calculations of the different states of the dication as a function of the carbon-carbon bond distance or the carbon-hydrogen bond distance. Uh, our goal in this experiment is to try to observe this proton migration induced by OJ uh, in the core ionized acetylene. So we got together a, a large group, the usual large crew that it takes to do an LCLS experiment. And uh, this experiment was led by Vladimir Petrovitz, who was a, a postdoc at Stanford. And um, uh, our method was uh, to use a, a very clever machine that was built by Nora Berra's group called an X-ray split and delay, where we take the X-ray laser and, and uh, reflect it from a split mirror so that the two different parts that hit the two different parts of the mirror can be delayed with respect to each other. So we can create two replicas of the same X-ray pulse that way. And uh, here's what we expect to happen. The first X-ray uh, uh, causes photoabsorption in the acetylene, and then Auger relaxation. And at that point, you have a dication. The second X-ray comes along and does the same thing. So you end up with a four times ionized molecule. Well, there's four atoms in this molecule. It can dissociate in different ways, but we can particularly look at the way where each atom takes one charge, and we get a four-atom four, a four fragmentation that we can then use as our signal in the experiment. And our aim is to figure out whether the protons are starting to move in between the first X-ray absorption and the second probe. So uh, here is a, 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 a simple uh, histogram, or movie, you might say, of what's going on. Um, we look at all of the momenta of the fragments, and in particular, plot the protons. So this is where the protons are located. Actually, these were heavy protons, deuterons, just to slow the process down a little bit and eliminate some background. At zero femtoseconds, as you might expect, the two protons are located mostly on opposite sides of the carbons along the carbon-carbon axis. And there's quite a valley in between. But even if with only a 12 femtosecond delay, this valley starts to fill in, and it continues to fill in uh, up to the longest delays where we looked, 100 femtoseconds. So this is already beginning to see one of the protons moving around and, and kind of reorganizing the molecule as a result of the X-ray excitation. You don't have to only use X-rays with these short X-ray machines. And so my final uh, example here is a transient OJ probe of electron dynamics. I want to show you what happens when you probe the uh, evolution of an electron that was, that was photo excited by ordinary uh, laser light. So this particular atom, thymine, that we looked at is, is, is famous because it's a, it's a DNA base. It's also famous because when it's photo excited with UV light, uh, even though there's enough energy to dissociate, to isomerize the molecule and break carbon-carbon bonds, that tends not to happen. The molecule relaxes very fast. And we wanted to understand why. So here is a, a, a simple schematic of what we expect happens in the molecule. The first excitation produces this very dangerous state where along the carbon-carbon bond axis, uh, it's a very steep slope for the molecule to start, to start uh, separating, and it starts to do that. But very quickly, that gets turned off. And there's a couple of ways why that might happen. One is that another electron that's not used for carbon-carbon bonding can go fill the carbon-carbon bond hole that's missing. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that the electron that was excited it can itself go back and fill that hole. So we wanted to understand how fast that reaction happens. Uh, there have been, because it's kind of an important molecule, there have been a lot of calculations and some, some uh, wide variation in predictions. Uh, some say that actually the excited molecule takes picoseconds to relax. Others say, no, it, it takes only a, a few hundred femtoseconds. The method we use to see this is, the, is by looking at the transient Auger spectrum of oxygen. Well, oxygen is not involved in this carbon ring. <clears throat> Oxygen is an, an extra atom that's out here on the outside. Uh, but its Auger relaxation spectrum tells you what the electrons are doing in its vicinity. 
And so we wanted to see those electrons change. So here we absorb uh, a, uh, 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 an X-ray photon to create a core vacancy in the oxygen, and then watch the Auger relaxation as a function of the delay from UV excitation and see how it changes. This is just a, a, a photograph of the experiment. Let me show you what we expect to see. As the molecule moves, we expect the, uh, the, the core ionized states to change in energy, and so the OJ spectrum should shift. So if we look at a different spectrum between relaxed and excited uh, thi uh, thymine, uh, we should see these sort of dispersive line shapes like this. In fact, you do see them. Let me show you this on a two-dimensional plot. Here's the OJ spectrum difference. That is, you subtract the relaxed thymine oxygen OJ spectrum, and you see a lot of excess right when you photoexcite, and the excess goes away right away. So that's the key. This is the signature of the excited state, and the length of time that it lasts, we see, is only on the order of a few hundred femtoseconds. So what that means is that there's no delay, there's no hanging up of the excited state of the molecule in this excited pi pi star state. In, instead, it relaxes either down to the n pi star state or down to the ground state. Okay? Uh, as you change the delay, you begin to see picking up a much lower energy feature. And that lower energy feature may be associated with the presence of the, uh, of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the molecule in a state where one of the, those oxygen lone pair electrons went and filled the hole. So that brings me to my summary. Uh, you know, these are strong fields and these ultrafast pulses, uh, I hope that I've shown you just a little bit about how these are becoming very important tools for the study and control of molecules, both ultrafast X-rays and the VUV from harmonics are actually now beginning to open up new doors that are bringing us down into this at a second regime. Uh, the key for the future of this field is to continue to improve our control over the coherence properties of these sources so that we can actually begin to now make uh, molecular movies and see the electrons move. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>